So good afternoon and welcome to every one of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us for today's uh, webinar or, or online seminar, which will be about uh, 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 real life collaborations between city administration and really the real estate sector. Uh, I'm Hans Günther Schwarz from the Austrian Ministry of Climate Change or for climate change and I'm the chair of the sub program on positive energy districts within the joint programming initiative Urban Europe. Uh, we started our sub program or our program, our initiative in the context of the strategic energy technology plan for Europe, the set plan three years ago. And we've built this into a full fledged uh, transnational research and innovation funding program with more than 20 countries on board. And now we will most likely become one of the pillars, the three pillars of the new Horizon Europe uh, co-funded partnerships driving urban transitions. Uh, it's quite significant for us that we look into the interactions between uh, certain stakeholders in the urban context. Uh, and that's because the narrative of research and innovation funding along the value creation cycles uh, of our economy is usually different. The story usually is, oh, let's develop technology, let's uh, let's put it in, uh, let, let's like uh, move it towards uh, pilot and demonstration phases, and then let the market take it and and you know run with it. Now this doesn't work the same way because industry uh, there's nothing that you can sell on the urban level which is just uh, scalable like like a product like a windmill like uh, a solar panel in the urban context if we want to really drive change we have to work in unison with what we call the problem owners or need owners and these are the the only ones who really put money on the table in the urban context this is cities who really build the infrastructure this is utilities who build the, uh, uh, the, the everything that's needed to run the city and it's uh, the real estate developers who build the built environment. Now this is new for research funders. <laughs> so we're learning a lot of things every day here through this dialogue with our problem owners and among them are cities and real estate developers and we'd really love to discuss in more depth, more in-depth with those developers and with the city administrations who have to, to work day to, on a day-to-day -day basis with those developers. That's why we have this webinar today. Uh, and without further ado, I just want to hand over to Robert. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot, Hans Günther. My name is Robert Hinterberger. I'm a member of the program management team of the PET program. And I will leave you today, so this uh, two, next two hours, so to this, uh, to this webinar. Sorry. Uh, yes, now we have the agenda. So we have two, two hours of time. So I will give a very, very short introduction. It's just one or two slides. Uh, and then I will hand over to Christina and Maria from the city of Stockholm to explain their case, to tell about their experience. Uh, and then we have a cool a session and a discussion. So the first hour would be more or less a presentation and cool a And then we have one hour time left for um, comparing also different cases in different uh, countries and cities and to match uh, and to uh, exchange our experience, experiences. So what's the topic of this webinar or this webinar series? We have started in January two webinar series. Uh, first, the cooperation between city administrations and utilities. And the second, and this today, um, cooperation uh, of city administrations with real estate sector. And uh, let's say four weeks ago, we had the best plugs examples of Grand Lyon, what we discussed their approach. And today it will be, uh, in some aspects similar, in some aspects of course very different and uh, just to make it very quick uh, because um, what I also learned from Christina uh, in the talk what we had uh, a couple of weeks ago 
uh, that uh, would be probably one of our focus of today to look at the different levels of commitment of quality insurance and the contractual agreements between city and the administration and the real estate sector, but also with the billing companies. So uh, as an example, as a city, of course, we want to have high quality standards of, of buildings. So somehow we are dealing with the real estate sector, okay, to get a Ferrari. And uh, at the end, we are not always sure if we get the Ferrari, even some that it's only a Skoda, or even it's not even a car. So it's a really quite um, diff difficult challenge how to ensure quality even in very ambitious um, district uh, real estate uh, development. And yes, I would like to hand over to Christine and Maria uh, to take the floor and to tell us about your experience. So please share your screen. Yes. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you. Robert, for this very nice intro introduction. I th think you can see my screen now, do you? Yes, but maybe to make it bigger. To, to yeah, of course, yeah. of course, yeah. Of course, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for inviting us today to this meeting. We are very excited to, to, to talk about our projects and we are very excited to answer your questions. Uh, today we are going to talk about our work in the Stockholm Royal Seaport, the city of Stockholm. And my name is Christina Salmhofer and I am working as the sustainability strategies at the development administration. And with me I have Maria Lennartson. Maria, would you like to present yourself? Yes, my, my name is Maria Lennartson and I've been working along with Christina for about 10 years now. And I'm, I'm supporting her uh, in this uh, strategy work, but I'm also coordinating research and development activities that we are conducting within the area. Maria, maybe you could speak a little bit louder because it's difficult to understand you. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, no, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Just five centimeters. <laughs> okay, great. Don't be too shy, Maria. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> okay, first of all, I, I think before we start to talk about the Stockholm Royal Seaport, I guess we should give you a little bit of a framework and telling a little bit about the city of Stockholm. Uh, the city of Stockholm has, since a very long time, a very long record of working with environmental issues, more or less since the 70s. And more or less in uh, 1976, actually the first environmental program was drafted and, uh, um, and uh, accepted by the politicians. And uh, right now we are actually, we have updated the 10th version of the environmental program, uh, which we are very proud of. And also we are working of course with the climate action plan, which is also very interesting because uh, at that point, uh, the city of uh, Stockholm has given itself a climate budget, uh, which a maximum of uh, 19 million uh, uh, tons of emissions by the year 2030 and afterwards it should be um, uh, net zero, which is also very interesting. And right now we are drafting uh, measures how to work with this CO2 budget. Uh, but of course, uh, the city of Stockholm has not always been, been as uh, clean and sustainable as you can see in this picture. Uh, in the 30s, actually, it was prohibited to swim in this water because it was so polluted due to industrial activities, but also not existing uh, wastewater treatment and so on. But in the 50s, they, they, the city of Stockholm took a systematic approach, uh, starting to work with a district heating system, wastewater management system, waste management system, uh, public transportation and so on. And since the 80s, you actually can swim and fish in this, uh, in these waters here again. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is something that the people of Stockholm are very proud of too. Um, so, uh, more or less about the city of Stockholm. Uh, the Stockholm Ray Seaport uh, was looking like this in the year 2009. Uh, this is a, a, a very large brownfield area, uh, which is about 240 hectares. Um, 
uh, and uh, it has uh, a lot of industrial, it had had a, a lot of industrial activities within this area, such as a container terminal, uh, an oil depot, old gas works area, which you actually can see in the front here. And, um, and this is what it looked like in the year 2009. Um, and uh, the city of Stockholm, the city council decided that um, that, that area should be um, revitalized uh, into uh, 12,000 uh, apartments and 35,000 working spaces by the year 2030. So uh, at that time, about 60,000 people should be working and living in this area. Um, so, um, of course, a lot of remediation started uh, to prepare the land to be able to for, for, for residential buildings and so on. Uh, the area is very attractive. Uh, as you can see here, it's more or less surrounded by the National City Park and, uh, and uh, it's uh, directly at the, at, the seas, at the seaside. Um, we also have uh, this beautiful gasworks area, which is going to be uh, renovated and revitalized. Uh, as I said before, we are also taking away the depot, uh, the oil depot and the container terminal. And, but we are also revitalizing the, the ferry and the cruise terminal, which is very exciting too. Uh, so um, in the year 2000. 20, so uh, last year, uh, it was looking like this. You can see on the, the forefront, already 3,000 apartments have been built. So already 7,000 people are living in this area. We have about eight uh, preschools, well, elementary school, a, uh, a library, um, a sport hall, and, and so on. So we are starting to develop in uh, th this whole area, which is also interesting to mention here in the year 2009, the city council decided that this area should become a sustainability profiled area. So we should push innovation. We should be a model for sustainable urban development, uh, but also uh, create experience uh, of good examples that could be uh, scaled up all over uh, Stockholm and of course nationally and internationally which is very ambitious of course. Um, actually in the middle of the picture you also can see um, the district heating, uh, the, the, the heating plant, the combined heat and power plant, sorry, uh, which is also in, uh, including a, a, a BEX which is a biofuel energy storage and uh, uh, storage and how, how do you um, uh, how do you how do you call it um, carbon capture and storage um, facility so this is a test uh, a prototype just to test how this um, uh, technology is going to work and actually it seems to be quite uh, successful but still the business model has to be developed um, which is not part of the of the actual sustainable uh, development of the Stockholm Royal Seaport, but it's very close to the development, which makes it very interesting. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, that the city council decided that um, the Stockholm Royal Seaport should become a sustainability area. Uh, the different administrations and companies within the city of Stockholm came up with this environmental program. Uh, which is uh, um, consisting of five different target areas, such as the vibrant city that should put the, the people in the center and uh, creating this safe and attractive site for the people living in, uh, an accessible and, and um, a city district that, that everything should be close to each other so that you can uh, create uh, sustainable uh, travel patterns, resource efficiency and climate impact should be minimized. Uh, of course, the blue and the green structure has a very important role to play uh, to, to strengthen ecosystem services and of course participation and consultation is a very important part of the democratic part of sustainable urban development. Uh, so these are more or less the, the main uh, target areas we are looking at. Maria, would you like to continue with accessibility and proximity? 
Yes, uh, we thought that we would give you some, some of the background and, and results from some of our target areas. Uh, accessibility and proximity is one. Uh, Stockholmers have a tendency of using public transport quite a lot and are using bikes more and more, but the city infrastructure has not been developed accordingly. Uh, so, next slide please. Uh, we we had a, a very ambitious target from the very beginning to reverse the, the traffic hierarchy um, so that walking, biking and public transport would be prioritized and all our ambitions and goals have been has been related to that. Next slide please. Uh, we did a very early um, systems analysis if we would consider all those uh, completely reversing the, the traffic hierarchy, what would the city look like? And some of the, the principles that we have been working with since is to, to straighten out the, the distance or the, the travel patterns for, for bikers, walkers uh, or pedestrians and, and public transport, but also make sure that there is a very good infrastructure for, for bikers in the city. Unfortunately, most of the bikers are thrown out into into the if you look at the picture at the left that it is very disrupted the whole biking system is very disrupted some of the some of the city has very good biking routes but then you are thrown out into the road so creating an infrastructure from the beginning with with different with highways for for bikers and and different different uh, patterns for, for different type of bikers is very important. Uh, also using the roads as something else than, than just allowing traffic to go through. Some of, of our minor roads should be more accessible for, for playing and, and uh, uh, recreational aspects and, and transport should be just a, a, a being able to, to move along the, the roads with, with cars should be not uh, downsized or down prioritized. So we call them Vistelsegata, um, which is uh, a, a street where you can, where you can relax and, and actually spend time instead of, of just uh, using them for cars. Uh, these are just principles, but they're actually getting into the planning at the moment. Next slide, please. The other aspect that we, we identified very early on was, was uh, parking. Uh, parking is, uh, we, we have a, a, in the city, there, there should be a, a approximately one parking spot per, per apartment. But in Stockholm Royal Seaport, the, the number was halved. So there's 0.5 parking spots for, for every apartment. But the question was, where do we locate them? In the early area, we located them under the properties or in the basements under the properties. But the, the principle that came up from, from this initial study was that we need to decentralize parking and decouple parking, uh, both from, from a accessibility point of view, but also from a cost point of view, because at the moment, parking is subsidized by everyone that does not own a uh, car. And by decoupling the, the parking and, and putting them in, in decentralized uh, spots, uh, the cost of parking would actually fall on the owner. Uh, this was, was a bit radical from the beginning, but uh, in, the, in the present planning, we are fortunate to have a number of, of uh, big caverns in the, large large caverns in in the rock so we have we have one parking garage that is going to be located in a cavern for about 1600 cars and the the property owners will buy into that parking garage uh, in the second area there is a there's another cavern but it's located about 20 meters below the ground and they're looking at turning or uh, uh, making that into a, a, a big garage as well. And this area we, we're looking at, the, at now, the last and, and uh, uh, well, the last area. There, we're also fortunate to have caverns here, but, but making, mixing cavern parking with, 
with subsurface parking is, is probably what is going to happen here, but still decentralized and decoupled from, from, the, from the apartments. Next slide, please. Uh, our planning principle is to have a five minute walk to, to necessary amenities and services. So we're planning from both a preschool and school point of view that it's going to be five minutes, uh, food stores and, and convenience stores as well, and to public transport. And so far we've been managing quite well. Next slide, please. Um, we also realize that we need to work more with the with the property owners because there are certain things that you can do in the in the infrastructure in the city, but then the the properties also need to be um, developed according to to the same principles. So we've developed a tool that we call the mobility index, uh, with a number a smorgasbord of of a number of of different uh, actions that could be taken on the property level. Uh, related to walkability, to uh, bicycles, to car parking, goods management, and then mobility as a service. And then depending on, on the property owner, they can, they can uh, de define or de design their own mobility index that suits their own property. And then they have to, of course, reach a certain level. Uh, we're hopeful the reason why we, we also developed this tool was that, uh, was that we, we realized that the quality aspect of, of mobility services and, and uh, 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 transport related uh, services are very difficult to, to uh, 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 require or put requirements on. It's better to, to give them a, a smorgasbord that they can choose from and, and then design according to what they think is best. I think that was it. No, no one more slide on transport. Uh, we also have, uh, we, we realized that, that transport during construction, the construction time was, was also a big issue. Uh, it's a big development with lots of people living in the, in the area while it's being developed. Uh, so we also de designed uh, a construction consolidation center. Uh, we thought it was mainly to reduce traffic, but we have also seen that there are lots of other benefits with the construction consolidation center. Uh, we do reduce the construction traffic into the, the construction site, but it's also from a safety per, uh, point of view. Uh, uh, we also, uh, safety point of view in terms of, of traffic accidents uh, that are minimized and also from theft and, and uh, uh, disappearing of, of materials and also from they, 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 it is a big uh, area where they can can store building materials instead of storing it outside that also allows allows them to save um, save money on on uh, destroyed uh, building materials so there, there are lots of, of benefits with this Okay, I think that was the last one on traffic. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I continue with resource efficiency and climate responsibility. But just to, to remind you that uh, the city of Stockholm owns the land in the Stockholm Red Seaport, which gives us the possibility to set requirements uh, on the developers. But of course, also our own work we're doing when it comes to uh, planning and building infrastructure as uh, streets, parks, and so on. Uh, so um, as Maria mentioned about mobility and uh, parking and uh, construction consolidation center, uh, all the developers are obliged to, to follow the requirements. So also they have to uh, connect to the construction consolidation center, for example. So they cannot choose. Uh, coming to resource efficiency and climate responsibility, we are setting quite tough requirements on the developers when it comes to low energy houses, locally produced energy on the facades and the roofs, uh, but also working very, very hard to become fossil fuel free by the year 2030, which is 10 years before the rest of the city of Stockholm, which is quite ambitious and especially when it comes to transportation, quite a challenge. Uh, but of course, waste management and soil remediation are very important parts uh, under this target area too. Uh, we 
start with energy efficiency and buildings. Uh, on this picture, you can actually see the result of one of our local agreement competitions, uh, where the developers uh, could compete on, uh, on a plot uh, when it comes to plus energy buildings. Uh, so those are two buildings that have been built uh, a little bit more than one year ago, uh, which is a very nice and interesting example of uh, beautiful architecture and energy efficient buildings. Uh, in total, we are setting requirements on low energy houses, not plus energy houses. Um, so right now we can see that the buildings which have been built are 22% lower than the national building code. And when it comes to the plus energy building, it's about 75% below national building code. Um, when, you, when you're looking into, into one of our uh, faces, um, which is um, that one, which I show in this picture here, which is about maybe nine developers who are, um, who are um, who have moved into this uh, uh, this area about two years ago? So those are metered values. When you looked into the 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 blue the blue, uh, the blue, um, the blue uh, how, how do you say Maria Balkan? Mm, yeah, yeah, um, top line. <laughs> the staples. <laughs> the staples. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know if this is the right word. Blue columns. Um, columns. Oh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, so the blue ones are the, the measured values and the, the orange ones are the projected values. And you can see from, from developer to developer, there, there are quite big differences between the projected and the, and the measured values. Um, and actually when we are working together with, the, with our developers, we are really working very hard to follow them uh, throughout the whole process, from early design process until two years after commissioning. And in that case, you can see on the X, on the X, X axis, you can see the developers, and then the Y, you can see the kilowatt hours per square meters. And this is uh, including heating, hot water, cooling, and building electricity. So on the first line, which is, li lies around 55 kilowatt uh, hours per square meters. This is the requirement we have set on the developers. And the, the line which is stated on 90 kilowatt hours per square meters, this is the national building code. Uh, and as you can see here, that there's a very big difference. And at the end, our developers had really big difficulties to um, when it comes to the measured values because they didn't really comply to the requirements we had set. And what we could see uh, was um, that they had a, a, a very big gap when it comes to quality assurance during construction and commissioning. Because during the design process, we could assure that the, the, the developers and the uh, architects, they had designed a low energy house. But at the end, when we were metering it two years after occupation, we could see that it, do, it wouldn't really follow uh, the the, the projected values. And a lot of what we could see this was especially on the heat, that the, the heat losses were much larger than they thought. It was about um, ventilation, it was about thermal bridges, uh, it, it was about um, a, a lot of different measures which we could see that there were a lot of um, uh, difficulties for them to, to reach up to. Uh, very often they had quite high indoor temperatures up to 22, 23 degrees. Um, and they had a surcharge for comfort floor heating, faulty fittings, and a lot of um, uh, problems uh, with, uh, with, with the metering, for example. Uh, so this was a very interesting experience. And actually it has been quite unique. Uh, for the whole um, construction industry and real estate company, because actually before not, nobody had ever looked at these details into the different um, uh, energy posts, such as heating, uh, hot water and building electricity and looking into and assuring that the, that the metered values actually were right and had the quality assurance on that metering. Christina, uh, yeah. I 
I just want to add something. It yeah. is very easy to to um, to say that this is just behavioral issues, but what we've learned through this process is that the behaviors of the of the uh, owners or tenants is not really the big problem. It's actually qualities quality aspects of the building itself. Yeah, and it probably has also a lot to do with the capacity on the con as well as the capacity and competence of people working on the construction site, especially when it comes to low energy buildings, what we also could see. Yeah, so I should also say that, that the developers themselves were taken by surprise. They didn't realize. Yeah. yeah. So that was uh, very interesting, uh, and actually, we, we, we still we, we are still on a very exciting journey together with our developers, because as we as we saw the results, we were questioning and asking what is the problem, and the developers they said we actually don't know. So we started a capacity building program that we invited all the developers discussing especially what went wrong. You need to investigate, we need to find out because we need to generate knowledge about this because this was quite unexpected. Uh, so uh, we are still building knowledge and our uh, developers are adjusting uh, the buildings and we hope that those uh, figures uh, in the next month can be lowered a little bit because we are still in the follow-up process together with our uh, developers. And there's a very big interest for the developer because, because as Maria said, they were taken by surprise. They didn't realize um, how bad it was in the buildings because they actually haven't had the metering before. Uh, so, but at the end, it's always interesting uh, to look at how we are calculating because everything depends on what would you account into the energy performance and how would you how would you account it so we were looking at a, another another uh, phase with about two for six uh, developers here uh, where we set our requirements if you heard as, as I told you before, it's about 55 kilowatt hours per square meter, including heating, hot water, cooling, and building electricity. Uh, and uh, when we were looking into the metered values, you could see quite big differences from developer to developers. Of course, the, the, the building envelope is, uh, is varying a lot here, uh, but it's not just about the building envelope. Uh, but you could see that the first building actually is the plus energy house. Uh, and when we were looking into and verifying uh, the, the results for the developers, we have a specific way to calculate this because we are, work, we are working with the primary uh, energy factor, which means that um, all uh, 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 electricity which is going to heating has to be multiplied with two and they are not allowed to compensate with electricity which is produced on, uh, in the PVs, for example. So th those are the results which you could see in the, in the third column. Uh, so if you look into the National Building Code, you can see that some of them wouldn't really actually fulfill the National Building Code. But of course, everything is about calculation. If you look at, if you would calculate everything according to the National Building Code, this is the last column, you would see quite big differences because in the, in the, according to the National Building Codes, you would not use the primary energy factor and you would be allowed to compensate electricity that is produced in the PVs, for example. So suddenly the plus energy building in the first row which from the developer, which is called Stockholm's Hem, would be just 12 kilowatt hours per square meter. So this is very interesting to, to, to think about. Would you like to come on and comment on that too, Maria? No, I think when we're talking about, when we're benchmarking our different projects and different uh, buildings, I think it's really important that we know what we are, are um, talking about, uh, both in terms of what energy flows we are calculating with, what we're including, what we're not including, and how we are compensating and not com compensating, just using this, the, the, if we could, we could add a, a third one, which is a Stockholm requirements, then we would have a completely different picture again. So depending on how we calculate, what we calculate, 
is really, really important when we are benchmarking. Um, and uh, just to mention here, these results that you see here, this is just one year after commissioning. So normally we, we publish uh, all figures two years after commissioning because it always takes two years for adjusting the systems and so on. But for us, it's very important to follow the developers already from, this, from the first year. So uh, I continue. Uh, I mentioned about local production of renewables. Um, as we do have uh, also requirements on our developers to create green roofs on the uh, on the on the roofs. <laughs> um, this is a very good combination, as the green roofs are lowering the temperature on the roofs, which is um, uh, increasing the efficiency of the of the PVs, for example. Uh, and already we have about each year we are right now producing um, five, 590 megawatt hour solar energy. Um, um, exactly. Um, we mentioned before that we should become fossil fuel free by the year 2030. We are working a lot with uh, infrastructure to, to make it easier for uh, electrical vehicles. Um, so uh, right now, 22% of the car parking in private garages have electric charging, but in coming up uh, fa uh, phases, we are focusing on that there should be 50% should be should have electrical charging. Um, on the uh, on the public spaces, uh, of course, electric charging is also very important. Um, we have very few parking spaces in the public spaces uh, because all has to be all the cars have to be away from the streets. <laughs> uh, so it's most it's mainly for people visiting the area for carpools and so on. But in the public spaces, about 10% of the parking spaces have electric charging. Uh, and then, of course, as Maria mentioned, the construction consolidation center, all transports are fossil fuel free from and to the center. Um, then, of course, waste management, we, we're really looking into this, uh, creating this red line for waste management so that you really can get rid of all your waste in a very, very easy way so that you uh, do not need to go with the car to, to leave your uh, uh, um, uh, your um, uh, waste, uh, everything should be um, uh, organized within the city district. So uh, we have this uh, automated uh, waste management system um, for three uh, fractions and then of course the environmental rooms for the rest of the fractions. We have the, the organic, organic waste grinder in all the kitchens uh, and, the, uh, and uh, the, the figures are really talking for itself. Uh, the re residual waste is, is much lower than the rest of Stockholm and also other comparable uh, city districts. What, what we have seen uh, mostly depending and that we are really working hard with that should be easy to do the right thing. And I guess also it's a lot about the integrated uh, organic waste grinder in each kitchen, which is lowering the, the residential waste. Um, uh, we, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of um, um, polluted uh, uh, land in this area with, due to the former industrial activities. So we have to remediate all land, uh, more or less, uh, and about 28% of the land is already remediated. Uh, so we are working a lot with the local soil management. We have this mass uh, logistics center in this area too, that is helping to sort the, the polluted masses from the uh, from the the clean ones so that we can reuse uh, the, the the clean soil as much as possible. So we have already handled um, two million tons of soil on site uh, to to avoid uh, transportation. Um, uh, so, um, and we have avoided a lot of transports by this. Uh, of course, we're also doing climate calculations. We have. Um, uh, set requirements on our developers to, to, to do climate cal calculations on your buildings. Right now, Christina disappearing. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Maria, do you also have the presentation? Just in yeah. case she's yeah. dropping, uh, Christina is, is dropping out. 
Yeah, I can I can take this picture. Uh, like like Christina said, we have had uh, requirements on the developers since uh, ten years back to do climate calculations for their buildings, uh, but we've also realized that they need to develop action plans for for the calculations. It's not really enough to do a calculation, uh, but also have a, uh, have a means to reduce the impact. Uh, the other thing is also we've started doing calculations on some of the important infrastructure because we're using very large amounts of, of concrete. Uh, one example is uh, a, an island that we're going to build uh, by just using a different way of, of constructing the island. Uh, we can lower or we can uh, avoid about 60% of the uh, emissions for for that uh, for that construction. So, using that as a as a way of of um, well, an extra input to the decision is is uh, has proved to be very important. Christina, now you can take over. Christina, you unmute muted, yourself. Muted. Yep. Are you are you muted, Christina? You're still muted, Christina? Yes, I, sorry. <laughs> it was a bit difficult to, to find my way out here, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I was thrown out, so that's why. <laughs> um, well, uh, we are working, of course, a lot with climate, climate adaptation that we are working with, the, especially with the green and the blue structure to, to fulfill different functions to create this multifunctional uh, um, areas so that help us to 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 handle storm water to increase bio, the biological diversity and to increase recreation of functions so we are working a lot with especially when it comes to the streets with uh, with um, uh, rain gardens and plant beds that help us to 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 collect all the storm water in these uh, rain gardens and plant beds uh, so uh, to avoid um, risk for flooding uh, which is we actually we also got the prize on that a landscape uh, a Swedish landscape prize which is uh, was very exciting to to get, and of course we are also using uh, actually we, we have used different kind of test beds for these planting beds and right now we are using biochar um, um, uh, um, that helps uh, to to uh, to collect the water uh, to 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 store the water to store the nutrients uh, and it's also actually sequestering uh, some co2 emissions uh, and park uh, parks are also something we are responsible for as the development administration so we're building uh, parks, for example, and uh, which are multifunctional. So once you can use it as a recreational area, it could be a flooding area, and then next time it is for the butterflies and so on. So we have created some uh, some parks within the area, and the people living in the area are very satisfied with the quality um, of these parks and areas. Uh, and we are also working with the Green Space Index, uh, which is uh, also set as a, a requirement on our developers. Uh, so more or less uh, creating high quality gardens that helps to fulfill the three functions I mentioned before. So it also means that all the buildings need to have a, a green uh, courtyard, green roofs and so on. Um, just uh, about cooperation. Maria, would you like to continue now, maybe? Yeah, I can continue. Uh, we, we actually tried to get a couple of our developers to participate, but we haven't managed to do that. Um, but uh, we, we are having a very, very close cooperation with developers. Um, and it's, a, it's quite a variety of developers. This is just a picture to show you the, <laughs> that there are lots of different stakeholders involved in, in uh, Stockholm Royal Seaport in one way or the other. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day, uh, cooperation, it's, it's more the interdepartmental cooperation that we have. It's a very 
it's a very new way of cooperating. We do have capacity development programs uh, with the, with the, for the developers, but also for all the project uh, people involved in the project itself. Uh, we have extensive communication activities and research and development projects that, that are also uh, contributing a lot to our cooperation. Next slide, please. Uh, the interdepartmental cooperation is actually based in the in the decision to to um, uh, profile the area. Uh, it was like Christina said, a decision from from the uh, political level, uh, but it's based in in the vision that the city has. Uh, we take in all the different city policies that that are. Uh, applicable for for urban development all from planning to environment to climate to traffic etc and then we have developed our own policy that is related to Stockholm Royal Seaport itself and the mission that we have is is to actually spearhead the development in Stockholm to to be the flagship for sustainable urban development and to develop the working processes uh, we can take the next picture uh, this uh, diagram might not look very innovative, but it actually is in terms of, of the cooperation in, within the city administrations in Stockholm. Christina has done a tremendous job of bringing a number of corporate or administrations together because a policy document that was drafted in 2010 is not enough. You actually have to bring people together um, to, to, and, and to, to set working, working principles for it. Uh, we also have a, a strong uh, support from the different administration heads. Uh, the city steering group is formed by the directors of the different uh, administrations. Uh, then we have a strong, uh, we have the project steering group, which is also extremely important in terms of, of support. We have tremendous support from the project management in, in the, for the whole project and Christina heads the sustainability, sustainability management group and she organizes these expert groups uh, that are consisting of experts from the different administrations and are, are really contributing with their expertise and, and their um, knowledge into the project. Next slide please. Uh, like I said, we, we tried to get some of the developers so, so that they could speak for themselves. Uh, so far about 60 developers have been involved in, in uh, the project or are involved in the project. Uh, some of them have already finished their projects and others are, are only having land allocation agreements at this point. So they're in very different, um, different phases. Um, we do use land allocation competitions both to set the price but also to to get uh, to get uh, to to try to um, establish the interest for for the area uh, it is a very very attractive area and the prices are high um, I sometimes say that having an attractive area like this allows Stockholm to actually push the boundaries on sustainable development. Uh, it would be much more difficult to, to implement a, a project like this in an area that is not as attractive as Stockholm Roy Seaport. Uh, the, the lots for uh, are very varied. We have uh, developers that are, are uh, have done two two apartments up to 300 apartments so the lots are, are very very different and like we said we have stringent uh, requirements but also very good feedback process uh, processes and I would say that the developers are extremely seriously committed in in this area it has also turned out that we have mainly medium-sized developers from the very beginning we had some of the biggest developers in, in Sweden, but they have not come back for different reasons. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we tried to get some of the developers feedback. Um, the three 
last ones are actually uh, quotes from, from emails that we've got saying that they couldn't participate. But the feedback that we normally get is that they, they do want to be involved in Stockholm RSC, but both from learning purposes, but also marketing um, their, their company. Um, um, the, the capacity development program that I will come to later is a very important aspect for, for learning, but also in dialogue and networking. It has been uh, an additional um, process to the normal uh, urban development process. Uh, they do think it's a very good cooperation, both with the city. Uh, it's, a, it's not just requirements with a whip or with a, uh, but we we are we are also listening. They they feel that we are listening to arguments. Uh, if they for some reason do not think that that the requirements are are valid, so it has been a, a very back and forth uh, good dialogue so far. Learning from both sides, we we must say both that 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 the city has also learned a lot from this process. It's just not the developers that have learned. Um, and one of the developers said that the stringent follow-up process is good. Uh, for some of you, you know Hamar Bilkhurastad, that was a previously uh, profiled area. There was requirements, but there was no follow-up process. Whereas here, we've had a follow-up process that, that has also brought, that has also contributed to a, a good um, dialogue. Uh, and like we said, the benchmarking, we're trying to really compare apples with apples and not apples with eggs. Uh, so the benchmarking uh, and the fairness of the follow-up process is also that has something that has been uh, appreciated from the developers. Next slide. Uh, we we did know we did understand that that our uh, most of our our requirements are very stringent, and we realize that we need to have some kind of capacity development program uh, for the developers, but also for ourselves to to make everyone understand and and have the same vision of where we're heading. Uh, all the agreement or the all the requirements are discussed with the developers before signing, but then we have. Uh, a series of 12 to 15 different uh, uh, seminars where the different requirements are discussed in detail. And, and in addition to that, we also hold many fairs with suppliers of different technical uh, devices that might be needed. Uh, and some of the, some very interesting results have come out of that fair. Next slide, please. Uh, we do have uh, the follow-up process is also communicated uh, from 2015 and onwards we are publishing a sustainability report um, where and, and the developers are aware that we are we are publishing all the results and all the results are communicated with the developers before publishing some of them are not very happy about it but it is part of the agreement and it has also proved to be a very good um, uh, way of, of uh, making them jump as high as they can. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can always go in and, and check the website. It is available in English as well. And the, the uh, web address is, is uh, down there. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, one of the most, one of the important aspects as well is that we have conducted a number of research and development projects. Some of them are very small and some of them are uh, bigger and more comprehensive, um, but they have all been extremely valuable for, for the cooperation process. Uh, I will take you through a couple of them, maybe three or four of them. Um, in 2011, we started out with the, with the EcoCycle model, 
uh, in Hammarby Sjöstad, uh, the, the three different utilities uh, developed an eco-cycle model uh, that, that led to a number of, of uh, quite innovative corporations at that point. Uh, but when we started doing it, we realized that there are so many flows that are interrelated and interactive, uh, and we need to go further with this. So, um, just, um, what should, uh, the interaction between energy systems and, and, and water systems and material systems are, are so important to, to bring into the process. It has been a learning curve having this, but it has also opened our eyes for what systems that are that need to interact more. We can take the next one. Uh, this has led to one other project, MACRO. It stands for Food and Food in Circular Robust Systems. And we're looking at the wastewater flow and what the resources in the wastewater flow can be used for. Uh, we are developing a, a source separated wastewater system where we separate uh, black water, which is the toilet water in one line, food waste in the, the other line, and then the gray water, the rest of the water in a third line. And to extract the, the different um, resources such as plant nutrients, um, um, heat, waste heat, uh, biogas and and actually water. We do have, Stockholm is located on the water, but it's still uh, we're still looking at at recycling water rather than than uh, purifying new water because the the infrastructure for for potable water is reaching its limit now. So Stockholm Water Company, which is also part of this, are looking at. Oh, if there is a possibility to actually treat grey water to a quality that it could be used for other purposes, such as um, uh, filling swimming pools or or use it for watering of green structures, etc. And maybe at the end also use it for potable water. Um, next slide, please. We've done a couple of, of uh, studies, uh, pre-feasibility studies on the fossil fuel free energy system. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work on the property level uh, or the building level. And uh, this was more to, to look at what additional uh, aspects we could raise at the, maybe at the block level or the district level, or, we, or if we should stick to the city level that we have at the moment. Uh, the outcome of this was that the district level is actually a very interesting level to look at. And that's why we're also part of the Cities for Pets project to see how we can develop a, a positive energy district for uh, about 4,000 uh, households at the district level. And uh, we're also looking at uh, uh, investigating the possibility of uh, extracting waste heat from uh, a 1500 households uh, in uh, in um, the northern parts of, of the city as well. Um, and we're doing that together with the energy utility. Next slide, please. Uh, well, some of the experiences are that, well, most of these projects that we've been doing uh, are funded either by the, by the project itself or by local uh, or national funding. Um, we haven't uh, uh, we haven't really been part in in uh, big European uh, projects uh, so far, and uh, but the seed funding that we've been uh, uh, getting has been very very important. Sometimes the seed funding allows us to do these what should I say the the in initial investigations to know where to go instead of jumping on board on a very big project to begin with. Uh, and doing this step by step has also contributed to a very good understanding, a mutual understanding, uh, what the issue is about, and also a common vision of where we should go. Uh, and I would say that that doing the, doing this within the city has has allowed the different experts to really uh, bring their experience and, and knowledge into into the project. And I would say that. I mean, 
the city experts have, have really flourished in some of these R&D projects. It's amazing how much competence is out there. But we've also worked very much with selected, carefully selected partners, knowing that uh, partner groups, uh, we might not always get to where we want to be if we don't have the correct or the, the best selected partners. Uh, but from a from a what should I say from a marketing side and also sharing experience side, but also getting experience from from the European perspective, uh, I think we're ready now to embark, embark on on larger projects in cooperation with more actors in Europe. Um, so, Cities for Pets is one of them, and hopefully we'll be able to cooperate with other stakeholders in Europe on a more wider wider perspective later next slide i think yeah christina you can take this you have to unmute yourself no christina uh yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a little bit difficult because I never find uh, find this little thing to 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 point at. Uh, yeah. So, what are the success factors here uh, when it comes to uh, our work? Of course, uh, as the the Stockholm Race Seaport was appointed to become a model for urban sustainable development, and the land is owning the land, uh, the city is owning the land. We have had it has been really important with uh, the political will. Uh, for our work and of course it also gave us this, this possibility to commit and to find also on the or the middle management the commitment which is so important to 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 succeed with the work uh, and this also made it possible for us to take a more uh, holistic perspective involving all the different administrations such as city planning environment and health uh, and traffic administration and so on uh, but uh, and, and this kind of interdepartmental collaboration really helped us to, to, to build up this mutual understanding and knowledge and to, to come up with a common vision, as we all do have different, uh, different uh, um, um, things we have to achieve within the administrations, which is not always uh, working together. Um, so this, this helped us really to move from the silos to a more uh, holistic perspective and collaboration work. Um, of course, the monitoring and measurement are really important. It's, it's easy to set requirements, but it's more difficult to measure and to follow up. Uh, and as Maria mentioned, capacity building has been really important because we, we also need to learn from the city but the, and the rest of the industry. Uh, and then of course it needs a, a, a lot of courage to, to be able to, to really um, stick with uh, the strategies you came up with. Uh, so this is just a, a short overview of what is planned. You've seen the picture from the gas works more on the, on the right side. This is the newer development, which is going to be built 2024 probably. Uh, in the forefront, you see this artificial island, which what Maria talked about. Um, and this is another area a little bit more south. Um, and this is also going to be built in the next, we, the, the building starts in probably one, two years, uh, but uh, the rest is still, um, some of it is still in the planning phase. And this is the last area um, uh, where we already have removed now the container terminal and there's the oil depot, which is, uh, which is right now being removed from the area. Uh, and probably we will be finished with the project uh, 2030 and some years, I guess. So I think this was everything we wanted to talk about. Uh, so if there are any questions, we, we would be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Christina. Thanks a lot, Maria. Very interesting presentation, very insightful.